Well, this morning, um, I'm very excited as we continue down the, this road of, of depending on the Spirit, this, this sharing the unwritten story. This morning, we have a, a special guest, and I'm going to invite you, David, to come on up. Uh, David Price has been kind of a fixture here uh, as long as I've been here. Uh, just the way that, that his life, you can come on up, David. The way that his life lives out a witness is one thing that, that has always just been such a blessing to me. And, uh, and he shared with me his story um, just a few weeks ago whenever we began talking about sharing the unwritten stories. <laughs> Give me a hand, David. Um, and so uh, he has a, just an amazing testimony that he wanted to share with you this morning. And so before he does, I wanted to say a prayer for David. Uh, and a prayer for us this morning that we will hear what God has for us all this, today. God, I thank you for the life of David Price. What a man of God. You have blessed him and you continue to use him to be a blessing to those around. I pray that this morning as we hear his story, that we hear your story. As we hear the plans that he has for each one of us. God, may we recognize that we have all received new life and that we all have been given an opportunity to do something with that. So, Father, this morning we pray that you will speak through David to each one of us. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, David, if you'll speak into the microphone so we can, we can pick you up. Actually, what it is, I uh, type it or inch high so that it's only a short time, so i got to be able to read it. Um, talking about the story of the need to serve, I would say the very first thing right on the top is um, I had a mother that um, I got my example for living and serving from. She was um, very much involved in the church. I was there when she retired from teaching uh, Sunday school. She had taught for 54 years. And um, so I, I salute the mothers in the church that are the rocks for a lot of us and the families. And I salute my own mother for that example that she gave us because uh, it meant so much to me. One thing I want to do for the young people in, in the group here, you just won't understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> I was born in 1937. Um, that was a time when everybody, every family didn't even have a radio. In the 1940 census, they uh, asked the question, does this family have a radio? Because the government wanted to know how many people can they reach if they have, you know, during wartime, they have an emergency announcement. So, um, so that means there was no TV, no uh, things sticking in your ear, no, no little box that you uh, pressed on. It must have been boring. <laughs> but we invented toys. We didn't particularly have them. One neighbor would have a baseball bat and somebody else would have a ball. And um, my brother, we found parts to a bicycle in the dump. And uh, after about three years, we finally had enough of them that we had a bicycle. <laughs> um, that's just the way it was in, in that time. Um, some of you may not remember we didn't have refrigerators, or at least we didn't. We had ice chests. And the ice man came by with a horse-drawn buggy. And if you put, a, I think, a blue page out on the, uh, you know, your window, that represented I wanted a 50-pound bag of ice. If you put the red sign out in the window, I think it meant you wanted a 25-pound chunk of ice. And you always put the money on the table where he could see it, so when he brings it in, there's no discussion. The money's right there. 
he'd put it in the uh, chest and uh, go on. Um, we had one neighbor that had a uh, phone, and Dad would pay him five cents every time, once a year when somebody would call Dad. And I never stalked on a phone until I was 17. Um, so times were different then, is, is the point. Um, bread was five cents a loaf. The working man could put in six to eight hours a day and he earns a dollar. Um, we, we can't relate to that today. <laughs> But anyway, um, <clears throat> in my story, what makes me really want to, um, and I get excited about serving in the church, um, mom had gone to a church where they had a membership card, and there's nothing wrong with that. It was a good church. But she found a Church of God, which was a new start in, in our community. And they believed in prayer. They believed in intercessory prayer. They, um, I think every one of them did spend an hour every day studying the Bible. Because when we came together at church as a little kid, I'm looking up at the adults, and, and uh, they're talking about the Bible. Um, that's even after the preacher is done. And um, so we had a very... Um, strong faith and the intercessory prayer was um, they strongly believed in it um, mom studied at least an hour every day after she got us breakfast or an office school and got dad fed because he came home from the midnight shift she laid down for an hour and we had enough sense to give her that privacy well what my story is about, when I was growing up, I had briefly heard one time mom said I had bronchitis. Okay, I'm here, I'm alive, I feel good. And I didn't think anything about it. But one day, with Marilyn and the kids and mom, you know, because we went home to Baltimore to see the family a couple times a year, um, there was an old lady in the church, and mom and her hugged, and they talked, and they sat down with us, and um, so it was nice. Mom had a, a, a friend with her from way back years ago. Um, then she said, <clears throat> Emma, is this the one? And I looked, and uh, she says, yes. I I'm the one what? <laughs> Well, I found out when I had bronchitis in their conversation, I had double bronchitis in both lungs. Back then, the doctor made house calls. And for two or three days, the doctor had been coming and visiting. They had no medicines for things like that, no penicillin in those days. And uh, one night, the doctor... Um, said that I wasn't going to make it through the night. Well, this lady that came to church was a prayer warrior. And mom recited to me, because of course as, as less than one year old, I knew nothing about the event. She came over to the house and said, Emma, what's wrong? I can't finish my morning prayers. So long story short, she held me while they both prayed. And then I started doing what, you know, I was trying to cough and I didn't have the strength to do it. So mom said she was totally shocked. Her friend picked me up by the legs upside down <laughs> and shook me. But mom said that gravity helped because the phlegm came out of my lungs and I was able to get a good breath of air. And um, so I feel like intercessory prayer has been in my life. And 
almost all the major crises. Like when I had my heart attack, Mel, um, some of us remember Mel, he was going to the church right next to me. He saw the ambulance in the um, driveway, so he naturally came over. So anyway, by the time I was taken to Indianapolis for the open heart surgery, um, their church had prayed for me because I know the people. I've been to some of their services. And, uh, of course, Mel came here and told Pastor Bob Pearson at the time. And this church prayed. And, of course, when I was conscious before I went, I, I also was praying. So I want to... Um, um, briefly um, say that the biggest joy is being able to serve and interact with young people, to interact with uh, our friends. I, I have enjoyed, I think, a blessed life, and I think I'm blessed uh, being in this fellowship. And I, and I really... My message, um, I told you it was going to be short. <laughs> um, my message, if it's anything, is that there is so much joy in serving and doing things and interacting with other people, especially if you know there's a need. And um, I feel blessed being in this fellowship. I feel spiritually supported. I, th to me, there are some spiritual giants in this church that I look up to, and um, I'm thankful for the blessings and the opportunities. And um, so, you're in my prayers. Okay. Thank you. Something that D David didn't say but was in the written form that he, he gave me several, several weeks ago was when the doctor came back that next morning, he was thankful that he didn't have to use, and the word he used was the death certificate because he wasn't expected to have made it through the night. And so, David, you were not just saved from something. You were saved for something. And so when I think of that statement and I think about, about what was going on in David's life and what, it, what was going on in biblical times and, and, and how, to, how does this thought process come together? And, and the story that that actually led me to was, was a story of, of Jesus speaking to a woman at a well. Because Jesus works in life. He works in our lives and he meets us where we are. And in John chapter 4, I'm going to read through this passage really, very quickly, um, and then we'll talk about this in a couple of other passages. But in John chapter 4, verse 3, it says, Jesus left Judea and departed again to Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So he, he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground where Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary... Wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, so that means six hours after daylight, so around noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. When the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews had no dealing with Samaritans and also a male with a female. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is you say to give me a drink, you would, be, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his son and his livestock? 
Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The water that you partake of Jesus brings about a giving of water. That's what we're talking about, saved for. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. And we'll open that up in just a moment. In a moment. Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said that I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and you Jews say that it is Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship, for the salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled uh, that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek or why are you talking to her? The woman then left her well pot, went, away to, went, went her way into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out to the city and came to him. And so I want to walk just a little bit about the, the information, the history that's going on here. So let me back up just a bit. Um, so about the sixth hour, she's there at noon. Now that is significant because why would anyone go in the heat of the day, in the middle of the day, to draw well water? Um, most people were there as close to daybreak. They tried to gather their water for breakfast, uh, and they would store it all day in large vats. Um, and so, so why is she there? Well, she is there because... Here, bup, 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 bup. Uh, you have said well, this last yellow part, for you have no husband. You've had five. So the woman's a little slutty, I guess. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't think of another word in the moment. That was probably very inappropriate. But so, so <laughs> she's had five husbands, and the one she's with now is not a... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, and so... So Jesus is pointing out, so why is she there in the middle of the day? Because the other women are there in the morning drawing well water. And I'm going to guess that she is probably highly ostracized in her community. So she's there in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, to, to not be made fun of, to not be picked on. Now, just to point out a moment, if everyone knew everything about you, how ostracized would you feel? I want to point that out because I'm saying that she's no different than us. <laughs> Guess we're all a little slutty. Um, <sighs> I back myself into corners sometimes that I just can't get out. We all have problems in our lives. Sorry, guys. Um, so, <laughs> I know, right? Remember, this is on the internet live right now. Um, there are people watching. Um, sorry, guys. Um, so anyway, so, so when Jesus offers to her a water, he is offering her a way out of her ridicule. And so her original response, which is, how can I get that water, is about how can I escape my present situation? How can I reduce the pain that is in my life? And so that is here. The water that I shall give you will bring up out of you a fountain. It will change you to the place that you will be offering the same kind of hope, love, grace, and forgiveness to others around you that I am offering to you. And when she hears this, 
It no longer matters. There's this whole interaction between the Samaritans and the Jews. And just a little history here. The Samaritans and the Jews are part of the same historic understanding of Christ, but they don't like each other. The Samaritans live in the place where where, um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob originally settled, and then they moved to Jerusalem, but they were in this area. That's why Jacob's well is here. And so you have this situation where they're historically part, but they don't even like each other anymore because they argue over where, where it is that they should worship. They argue over what color the carpet ought to be in the sanctuary or whether we should have drums or not drums, whether we should have an organ or not an organ. They, they, they complain over whether the fans should be on or off, whether the, the thermostat should be covered by a lockbox so nobody can touch it or whether it shouldn't. They argue over ridiculous things. And so Jesus says, the hour is coming when that doesn't matter. The true worshipers, it's not about the place. It's about the spirit and the truth. And so Jesus is talking to this. And and when I was going through this and I thought about this, the woman then leaves, she leaves behind her this very important thing. We kind of pass over this. She leaves behind her well pot. She leaves behind the very thing she's putting on a hook to get water because she now sees and believes that Jesus is offering her something that she cannot get on her own. She leaves her well pot behind and she runs to town. Now, I think there's probably a significance. She runs and she tells the men. Why? Because the women aren't going to listen to her. She tells the people that will hear her where they can find this same living well. Now, I'm going to say that in a way that that I hope you can catch because there are people in your lives that you have the ability to influence and there are people in your lives you have no ability to influence. We all have those people. So when we go to people, we need to be wise about that. We have that grace, love, and compassion that we offer to everyone, but we need to recognize there are people that will hear you and there are people who will not. And do not write off the people who will not hear you, but continue to offer grace, love, and compassion. Continue to love them and share with them because they will still hear you even though they may not listen to you. If you share it long enough and you share it sincerely enough, those words will be heard. So then there's another story, an Old Testament story, so that, we don't, so that we begin to understand that this is not just a New Testament concept, but it's been part of God's plan all along. There's this story in 2 Kings 5, one of my favorite stories, honestly, and I, don't, I, I, I was talking with Ryan this week, and he goes, Trey, he says, you share this with me all the time, and I don't know how often you have ever said it on a Sunday morning, so I'm going to share it with you. Now, Naaman was a commander in the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram, a foreign country God had given victory to. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He had a problem. He was a great man, great power, great influence, but he had a problem. Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. Total coincidence. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria. Huh, Samaria, a place where God is. He would cure him of his leprosy. So he went down and dipped himself. There's, I skip over a bunch of stuff. He, he hesitantly went to Samaria and saw Elisha, And Elisha told him to go dip in the Jordan seven times. And he he wasn't real excited about that. Uh, If you want to go read that story, it's a great story to read. But he finally gives in because one of his servants says, hey, if he had asked you to go, like, kill a country, you'd have thought that was a great thing. Just because it's something stupid like dipping yourself in the water seven times, you're going to avoid that. So finally he relents and he goes. So then Naaman and... um, 
to the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. But may I ask the Lord to forgive your servant for one thing. When my master, the king of Aram, enters the temple of Ramon, who he worships, to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. And Elisha's response is so simple. Go in peace. So, so when, when we give our heart to God, there are things in our life that aren't always going to match up. There are things in our life that we are going to have to do for our jobs in this case or for our families in other cases that seem like they are totally against what God's plan is for us. But here's the thing. Just like the woman at the well who was offered a new life, just like David who was picked up by his ankles and shaken in 1937 when he was an infant, new life is offered to Naaman. And there's something David did not know as an infant that his life had been spared, but I promise you everyone in that church knew. Because I'm guessing your mom didn't keep her mouth shut about that. I'm guessing that none of us would keep our mouth shut over something so amazing. Well, guess what? When Naaman goes back to the king of Aram, he no longer has leprosy. You can't keep that a secret. That's not something that just slips by people unnoticed. Leprosy in its advanced stages is pretty nasty. People lose appendages that just fall off. They're covered in boils and scars and nastiness. And and often when they went in public, they had to wrap their entire body up so that people wouldn't be disgusted by them. I think somebody's going to notice that he doesn't have leprosy. And I think when that happens, he's going to share with them how the leprosy left his body. So when it comes time to do his job and to help his king into the temple of Ramon, so if he has to go down to a knee, do you think he's worshiping Ramon there? No. He knows the true God. And so the, the question that he has is, what do I do now? And, and what, 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 what I, Elisha says to Naaman is, you go back home because your life is the story. They will see your healing and there is no way after you have experienced this that you will ever go back to calling Ramon your God. When you've been healed of something, You can't help but live a new life. So the question is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to be changed? Do you want to be desperate? Do you want to be hungry? Do you want to be his? If so, how will you respond? Worship for what he did or for shame for who you were? Because How often do we get caught up in not sharing this God story of what he did because in order to do that, we have to share who we were? Guess what? You're both. You're both. So so maybe you were a sex addict. So maybe you were a drunk. So maybe you were a drug addict. So maybe you were anything. So maybe you were a hoarder. Maybe you were... I don't know, fill in your blank. Fill in your blank. I'll go ahead and say what I said a while ago. Maybe you were a slut. I don't know. That's not my job. I'm closing my eyes to even say the word again out loud. But but wherever you were in life, if God delivered you, it's a story. It's his story. So don't be ashamed of that. But we still have options in life. And so I want to show you one other option. 
In Luke 12, starting in 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me? I love that. Man, who appointed me to a judge over an arbiter? No, anyway, sorry. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over between you? Then he said to him, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. This parable is what I want to look at. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there, will, there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, self You have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. What a weird sermon. What a weird parable that Jesus would ever say. And what a parable that you almost never hear an American church talk about. America, the only country in the world where we build buildings to store stuff that won't fit in our home. The only country in the world that does that. We build buildings in our backyards to hold the stuff that won't fit. We fill our attics with stuff that won't fit. Then we rent storage units for stuff that won't fit. And we're poor by our own belief. I want to share with you kind of what this story tells us. It's really weird to us that God would call this person a fool. But I want to point out just a few things here. Um, all right, the grand of a certain rich man had an abundant harvest, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear. I will store. I'll say to myself, If we took it grammatically correct, I have plenty of grain laid up for many years, so I will take life easy. Now, what's the word that you think I'm pointing out here? Um, Jesus' world was about community. When I talked about the offerings a while ago, I talked about how there is something that we can do that you could never do by yourself. Jesus' world was based on a community perspective, and that is we exist for one another. Now, the American culture says, I exist for my pleasure. And Jesus has a word for that. Fool. Fool. Our very understanding of individualistic culture is against what God calls us to be. And so when God saves you from something, he saves you for something. And so this man has a problem. He's got more food than he can eat. He's got more food than he can store for an entire year's worth of eating. And so what does he do? He makes it so he can have more. What would would someone in that culture have done? And it's obvious because he's talking to himself instead of to friends. Recognize that point too. So I said to myself, self, what shall I do? Well, he's not asking God and he's not asking friends because there ain't none of them around. Not for him. 
And so he decides to store up. So we have an option. We have an opportunity when it comes to what do we do with the information, the, the knowledge that God has given us, with the salvation he has offered us, with the ability to take away hurts and pains and addictions and hunger and thirst and all of those things. When he takes those away from us, what do we do with them? Oh, thank you, God. Give me more. Give me more. Fill me up, God, for I leak. You shouldn't leak. You should pour out. So what do we do? What will you do with what God has given you? What will you do? And I'm not just talking about your financial gift. I'm not just talking about, I'm not just talking about what you, your house, your cars, your money, your things like that. I'm not talking about physical things. What will you do with what God has given you? God has given you your story. God has given you the ability to reach other people. There are people in your life who need to hear a story of hope right now. Some of them will listen to you and some of them won't. But you have a story. Now I'm going to let you in on my little secret. All right? Yeah, it's all kinds of fun to invite people to share their story every Sunday. But there's a reason why we do that. And there's a reason we're going to do it for a year and beyond. Because I'm hoping the more that you hear other people's story, it will give you a story to share with someone who desperately needs to hear a story of hope. But I'm hoping also in the process that you will gain confidence in your own story so that you may be able to share your story with someone who needs hope. And by giving you an opportunity to come here, and, and, and as scary as it may feel to stand in front of 85 people and share your story, Every person that sits in this room every Sunday wants the very best for you. There is not a safer place for you to practice telling your story than right here. Amen. And so I wanted to give you a place where you could do two things. You could work on identifying a story in your life that you can share, and then you can have practice sharing it. And once you can share it in front of 85 people, one person is pretty darn easy. So I want to give you those kind of opportunities. We're currently studying a book in our, in our midweek groups, and it's just Walk Across the Room by Bill Hybels. And in the very first chapter, he asked these questions. And so I just want to ask them to you. Do you believe that every person you know would be better off living God's way? I, I hope so. Um, and do you live a life in such a way that others around you know that you believe that? <sighs> you can have your knife back, Trey. Um, I want those to kind of, kind of be with you. I got one more question for you. I was at a preaching conference about six years ago, and... Peter Rollins is a Christian author, and he's kind of a provocateur of Christianity. Um, he is from uh, Belfast, Ireland, and the Irish just really love to fight. So that's kind of his personality. Um, and he is kind of a rebel within the Christian walk, but he, was, he, he, he usually stands outside the fray. And so he was on a radio station in, in Ireland, and the, the, the guy asked him, says, do you deny the resurrection of Christ? I mean, you're so out there. Do you deny that Christ ever rose from the grave? And his response caught me off guard. But it caught me off guard in a good way. And he said, yes, absolutely, I deny the resurrection of Christ. I deny that Christ rose again for my salvation every time I don't treat someone with grace, love, and compassion. Every time I don't lend a helping hand to someone that's hurting, I have denied that Christ has power in my life and denied that Christ has power in their life. And then Peter Rollins turned around and walked off the stage, and I was angry because I needed more from that statement. But it changed me. And, and luckily, the guy who was giving the conference stopped him from leaving the stage and said, wait, wait, wait you got to come back and talk about this a minute. 
And he said, I do, we as a Christian people, when we don't live out the example that Christ lived for us and died for us, we deny his power. We deny it in our lives and we deny it in the people who need to hear. We deny his, his very resurrection when we don't share it with other people. And so I just wanted to kind of I just wanted to kind of leave you with that thought, and perhaps that's something that can be transformative to you. Perhaps it's someone that it's 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 a way that it will help you to live a life that's transformative to others. God has called you to go in peace, as He called Naaman. What we have to continue to answer is: Would God say, looking at our lives, that we are living a life of peace, or would He have to call us a fool? And so this morning. This morning as we, as we close out, it is a communion Sunday. And so that means this morning, if, if you want to be a part of, of understanding God's sacrifice in our life, then you are invited to be here and to be a part of our communion. Communion here is not a closed event. And what I mean by that is you don't have to be someone who calls themselves a church of God person. You don't have to call this your church home in order to take communion. What you have to do is you have to want to be growing closer to Christ. Do you have to know everything about him? Nope. But do you want to know him? Do you want to invite him to walk closer with your life? If so, you're invited here at our communion table. And here's what these elements are. Up here, there are two things. There's this little piece of bread, this little wafer. And this represents the fact that Jesus was a human being and he walked this earth. And he lived a life that was sinless. Doesn't mean he wasn't tempted. We have very clear scriptures of him being tempted. But he always was able to turn away from the temptation and follow the path that God had for him. Even to this point. Even to the point where his body was taken and it was broken. And his blood was poured out so that it could wash away all of our sins. And so that's what these are for. Just a recognition that he was, he was alive, he was a human, he was flesh, and that he bled and died for you and I. That's why in the back of this room, there's a cross. And here in the church of God, in, in our church, that cross is empty because Jesus is not there anymore. The story did not end with him dying. The story ended when he walked out of his very own grave three days later. And he did that so that he would conquer sin and conquer death for you and I. And so this morning, I'm going to say a prayer, asking God's blessing on these elements, and then you'll be invited to come. Um, and just whenever you're led over this next song or so, um, come and you can grab a glass of juice for you, um, grab a wafer for you. If there's someone that's around you who doesn't have the strength to come and get that, I'd invite you to grab some for them as well. You can come, you can pray at an altar. And these are just a special place that you can kind of have some alone time with him that people aren't going to bother you or bug you this morning. You can just talk to him. You can go back to your seat and you can take your communion there. But we come to a common table because this was for all of us. And so let's pray for a blessing for this and, and for you as well. God, we thank you for the life you lived. We thank you for the love that you have given us. We thank you for the example that you've given us. And, and God, we thank you that you have saved us from a fate that is far worse than we ever want to imagine. But you have saved us for something. You have saved us to be your voice and your people here and now on this earth. And we just pray that, that you will anoint our steps as we come forward to take communion, that you will anoint our steps as we go out into the community, that we will be, we will be beacons of your grace, love, and compassion to the world around us. We pray that, that this will be a reminder of what you have done and that you, through that, will remind us of who we are to be. 
Father, we are yours. And Father, for those this morning who are wondering and struggling, I just pray that your spirit will rest on them and comfort them this morning. That you will give them the strength to ask questions. You will give them the strength to reach out. You will give them the ability to grow where they are to the point that they want to trust you. God, walk with them and put on their hearts a special burden to find someone to confide in, to share with, to ask questions of. Father, we ask a blessing on all who come to this table and to the tables around the world as people are gathering to take communion this morning. May we all honor you as the body. May we all honor you as your bride. And may we change this world one, one spirit at a time, one life at a time, as we change it for you. In Christ's name, amen. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. paid it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne I stand in him complete Jesus died my soul to save my lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a and stain, but he washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow.
This week, I pray that your life is noticeably different to those around you. I pray that as you open your mouth to speak to people, they will see that the leper spots are gone, that you have been washed clean, and that because of that, you have something to say. You have a story to tell. And I pray for you that you have the confidence and the integrity and the desire to share your story because your story is his story and it is valuable because you are valuable. You were created by God to love and he loves you just because he created you. And because of that, you have worth. You are in God's image, which means you have great worth. So go and may God bless you and anoint your path. Amen. You are dismissed.